So guys, welcome to Unit 5, which is a prelude to our programming unit, programming modules that we will be discussing later on. Um, the topic for this week is about algorithms in the code and setting up your phones to use Python. Okay. Now let's get started. Algorithms are at the very core of successful and efficient development. You'll use them as you learn to code. You'll be asked about them in technical interviews and they're likely be part of your day-to-day -day development work. Now, these terms apply to development jobs as a programmer but actually algorithms can also be applied into your everyday life um algorithms pertains to how something is done or how a problem is resolved that is the most basic meaning of algorithms learning from common algorithms individually is helpful but what's even better is getting used to algorithmic thinking. You can train your brain to understand and follow algorithmic logic. Writing your own algorithms will become much more intuitive. Do algorithms make you, uh, make you anxious? Do they seem complicated and too hard for you? Or are you unsure about what they even are? If you feel any of these feelings or feel like you can be a real developer unless you know them, you're not alone. Learning common algorithms individually is helpful, but what's better is getting used to algorithmic thinking. Okay. Algorithmic thinking is the pattern or the means in which you approach or provide solution to different problems, not just in computers or in programming. Algorithms and data structures are bugbears of the software development world. Traditionally, educated developers were probably taught about them in one or two classes, and self-taught or bootcamp developers often are exposed to them at all. Even so, for most beginner developers, algorithms and data structure are the sources of our lack of anxiety and imposter syndrome. Using algorithmic thinking for fun and profit. Thinking algorithmically is a mind shift from how we as people usually think. It's more of a systematic way of thinking through problems and solutions in a way that's similar to how a computer would run. But that's surprisingly difficult. We all have unconsciously built up shortcuts, assumptions, and rules of thumbs that we used to help us solve everyday problems without thinking about them. For instance, take the simple task of sorting 10 numbers. As it stands, you can take a look at them, tell pretty quickly what the order should be, and how to arrange numbers correctly. However, we're not used to breaking our thought process down into individual steps and translating that to what computers can do. For instance, computers can jump to general spots in a dictionary to find a word based on its spelling. Computer has to have very specific instructions in where those are. Plus, they can do truly random numbers. Okay, just let me explain this one. For instance, computers can jump to can jump to general spots in the dictionary to find a word based on its spelling. We have to instruct a computer on what particular pattern or what particular word should be searched. For example, in Google, it cannot just randomly search what you are thinking right now, but maybe in the future it can be, especially with the development of artificial intelligence. A computer has to be very has to have very specific instructions. You have to tell the computer on what to do and what must be done. Okay? We, we have to specify the instructions. Also, as you can see here, computers cannot really generate random numbers. In fact, computers have pattern when generating random numbers. Another example is looking up a name in a phone book or a word in a dictionary. As humans, we generally know, given a name or word, how far into the book we need to start our search. If it begins with A, we start in the beginning. If the name starts with M, we jump to the middle of the book and so on. For beginner developers, it's tricky to break through that thought process and translate that 
to computable steps since computers generally can make the types of judgment calls about where in the list to start. So how do you think algorithmically? Like all skills, it's learnable and just it takes practice. It's like getting a feel of for how to organize code into classes in object-oriented design. To do your best and iterate on the solution to improve the weaknesses that you will find later. Object-oriented design though have some guidelines that can help you get there faster. At its essence, algorithmic thinking is thinking about how to solve a problem in a systematic way. It's about defining the problem clearly, breaking it down into small, simple parts, defining the solution for each part of the problem, implementing the solution, and making it efficient. But wait, what is an algorithm, algorithm exactly, and why should we care? Before I started learning algorithms, I was intimidated by them. I felt that they were complicated, hard to learn, and heavily mathematical. Algorithms felt complex and beyond my ability to understand. I was pretty sure that they were important to know, but I didn't know the best way to learn more about them. Makes sense given that we hear about tech companies' new algorithms constantly. Like for example, Google, Google search algorithms or Uber algorithms for finding the best bike or the, the car in the machine. We hear about inexperienced algorithm questions in whiteboarding interviews. We're constantly told about how important and complicated they are, but mostly by people in the media who don't know much about them. Maybe my personal anxiety was because the word algorithm sounded so much like logarithm that I associated algorithm with math and difficult concepts. If you are familiar with the word logarithm, logarithm is a very difficult topic, especially for me with regards to mathematics. I'm not sure, but now that I know what they really are, I want to help you overcome any fear and certainty and doubt about them too. Algorithm is a general term that has been overblown in software development. The simple truth is that algorithms are just ways to do things. They are processes to solve a type of problem, like finding a word in the dictionary, sorting a list of numbers, or generating the Fibonacci sequence. For all of you who don't know what a Fibonacci sequence is, in mathematics, Fibonacci numbers commonly denoted F, form a sequence called the Fibonacci sequence such that, such that each number is the sum of the two preceding numbers starting from 0 and 1. That is, 4n is greater than 1. Finding prime numbers, making a cake, doing a laundry, or making fried rice with epsilon. Now, to be fair, many algorithms that make the news these days are impressive and complicated and require deep knowledge of computer science, coding, machine learning, and mathematics. I certainly don't understand most of them. However, because there are different algorithms, doesn't mean that all algorithms are complex. To start thinking algorithmically, you start thinking two challenges, one of two ways, breaking the problem down and building the solution up. The natural tendency is to build a solution first. However, I would advocate starting with breaking the problem down and only building a solution up. Break it down, breaking a problem down to develop an algorithm. Don't worry if you don't naturally start with breaking a problem down. Breaking a problem down first doesn't come naturally from the most developers and aspiring developers. However, taking the time to break down a problem helps us better understand the problem and see how solutions naturally spring from that understanding. That is helpful to avoid being overwhelmed when facing a new problem that is outside of your comfort zone. For search problems, we generally need to know the problem. Where and how to start the search, when and how to stop the search, how to compare the two list items to determine which is before another or which comes first, how to continue the search when you haven't found the word yet. The better an algorithm, the shorter the time is between one and two, and the fewer times you need to do numbers three and four. For our dictionary search problems, we can expand on the above bullets and break the problem down into number one, the expected, expected order of the word. For example, is it in alphabetical English? 
also compare to different words and determine which one should be before the other one relative, relative, related to point one. How we know we found the word, and lastly, how we know the word is not in the dictionary. We will assume that points one and two are taken care of by using the English alphabet for the order, and that we can easily determine the order of words by the alphabetic order of the letters that leaves the last two items. Naturally, we know we found the word when the word in our search position is exactly the same as our search word. Most programming language these days can tell if two words are the same if one is alphabetically before another one. So that's one. So that one is taken care of. As for item four, if we get the end of the search and still haven't found the word, we know it's not in the list. This assumes we've done the other parts correctly though. Getting started. Now, how do you get started thinking through these problems in the first place? You have to start somewhere, right? To start working on a problem, I find it useful to initially think through it using a very small sample set of data. The size should be easy enough for you to think through and physically write or draw it out if necessary. In math, there's the process of proof by induction. It's the idea that if you can prove that a mathematical formula works, for a case of one item, and you can assume it, it's true for n minus 1 or n dash 1 items, where n is some unknown number. Then you can try to prove it for a case of for n numbers. If the formula works for n items, then the formula should work for any number of items. Using that concept for, uh, for our algorithm, it, we can make it work with one item in a dictionary and then make it work with 10 can probably make it work for any number of items. To confirm, you'll ultimately test it with a lot more. This low buildup helps you understand the details and find the subtle traps of the problem. Build it up building an algorithm of in simple steps. It's probably very tempting for you to start with trying to build the solution. I'm the same way. Building a solution to a problem is the entire point of coding to begin with. So it makes sense that we want to get it into it immediately. I've had instances where I jump into solving the problem too quickly and put in a few days of work before realizing that I can solve it the way I thought because I didn't understand the way the existing code affected the problem. It's like getting halfway through baking a cake and realizing you didn't have all the ingredients or needed to know a certain whisking technique to make it properly. I've learned the hard way. If we don't fully understand the problem, we won't build the best solution. Or maybe we will, but it will take us longer to get there. Now, finally, I can practically, practically hear you sigh with relief. You're ready to start building the solution since you've broken the problem down so you understand its pieces. At this point, it's down to building a solution in parts. Each part of the solution addresses one or more of the parts of the problem you've identified. How you build the solution now is somewhat flexible. For me, I like to build the easiest, most straightforward part first so I have some success and a framework to build the rest of the solution on. In the case of the dictionary, I might build up the solution like this. Number one, write the loop or recursive function. Now the loop is a repeated task wherein this particular process is repeatedly done or it is repeatedly referenced or called upon. Number two, write the code to exit the loop or recursion, recursion if the word is found. Number three, write the code to exit the loop if the word is not found and you've searched the whole dictionary. Number four, write the code that decides how to search next if the word is not found but the dictionary is not exhausted. Number five, fix edge cases, boundary condition problems, and other details, like what happens if you pass an entry list. Searching and sorting algorithm are good places to start getting a handle on algorithmic thinking because they are related, fairly self-contained, easy to draw, and step through, and they build up in complexity. Guys should do not need to be confused on this particular searching and sorting algorithm as I've only discussed this for you to have an idea. Basically, the searching and sorting algorithm, work, which I will uh, give you some examples later on, are the main basis of logic of the different 
programs, whether that program be basic or that program is very complex or difficult. The real world. The process is often less obvious for most real world development tasks. In most developer jobs, you're fixing defects in an existing code base or adding features to it. You still need to break a problem down to its smallest part and start building up the solution in pieces to address each of those parts. But it will probably involve designing classes, their methods, and tying them all together. As you slowly build up from small and simple to big and complex, you keep each step manageable and isolated. You introduce changes slowly, and so when things go per shape, the possible causes are small and easily discovered. Also, it's important to keep in mind that you may not know how to implement a fix or feature at first. In fact, it's quite likely that you won't know how to implement it at first. This is especially true if you're adding features or fixing a defect in an existing code base, which is very common with most dev jobs. I've had cases where I spent many days or even weeks trying different things to determine how I might implement a feature or fix. In the end, I had something that works but was ugly and inefficient. But that experimentation gave me the knowledge to go back and rewrite the code in a much cleaner and more efficient way. Give yourself permission to experiment with solutions and accept the reality that you probably have to try a number of times to get it to work, then even more to get it to be efficient and clean. How to get better at algorithms. One of the many old age questions, how do we get better at any skill? The simple and annoying answer is to practice, like object-oriented development and programming in general, Experiencing challenges and learning from them is probably the best way to get better. But you can speed up the process by learning about existing algorithms and implementing them yourself in different languages or different ways. Studying existing algorithms. It's arguably a good thing to understand the algorithms that form the foundation of a lot of fundamental concepts of programming. Most conversation in books and classes revolve around a few well-known search and sort algorithms, which I'll mention below. These algorithms are solid places to start because searching and sorting are two actions that nearly every developer needs to do at some point in their career. Furthermore, searching and sorting algorithms provide a big basis for understanding an algorithm's efficiency and edge cases. In fact, in the free page of his third volume, As the Art of Computer Programming, Donald Clark Donald Nutt says you believe searching and sorting are great places to start because they get you thinking about how new algorithms are created, how algorithms can be improved, how you can determine an algorithm's efficiency, and how you can choose between different algorithms. Here are some of the important search and sort algorithms that every developer should be able to explain. For searching, we have the linear and binary. For sorting, we have insertion, selection, bubble, merge, and quick sort. Thankfully, you probably never have to actually implement any of these algorithms as a developer. This case, the most efficient search and sort algorithm is provided in standard libraries that come in most languages. However, just because you don't have the right version of a bubble or a binary search is not a good reason to skip understanding and being able to write them. These algorithms form the foundation for understanding algorithms as a whole. They teach you how algorithmic efficiency has real world effects and how newer, more efficient, and more complicated algorithms are developed. Now let's go to how do we code pseudocode. Make it clear, easy to follow, and understand. Developers or data scientists they often go to many stages from getting an idea to reaching a valid working implementation of it. We need to design, validate an algorithm, apply it to the problem at hand, and then test it for various input data set. The initial state of solving a problem, it helps a lot if you can eliminate the hassle of being bound by the syntax rules of a specific programming language when we are designing or validating an algorithm. By doing this, we can focus our attention on the thought process behind the algorithm, how it will or won't work, instead of paying much attention to how current our syntax is. Here, where the code comes to the rescue. So the code is often used in all various fields of programming, whether it be a development, data science, or web dev. So the code is a technique used to describe the distinct steps of an algorithm 
in a manner that is easy to understand for anyone with basic programming knowledge. Although so the code is syntax free description of an algorithm, it must provide a full description of the algorithm's, algorithm's logic so that moving from it, the implementation should be merely a task of translating each line into code using the syntax of any programming language. Take note, guys, so the code can be used for any programming language like this Python, C, or Java. Basically, we are writing pseudo or false code, which can be rewritten into any programming language. Okay, take note of that. Why do we use pseudo code? First, better readability. It is easier for us to work alongside with people from other fields, such as mathematicians, businesses, managers, and so on. It's able to explain the mechanics of the code that will be able to help us communicate between the different backgrounds easier and more efficient. Ease of code construction. When the programmer goes through the process of developing and generating pseudo code, the process of converting it into real code in any programming language will become easier and faster. It is also a good middle point between flowchart and code. Take note, guys, you could easily convert pseudo code into a flowchart, okay, and into a code. Act as a start point for documentation. Okay, you can make use of pseudo code as a starting point of documentation for our project. Curves as a doc string at the beginning of the code file. Okay, a programmer use pseudo code as a documentation for the actual program code. Provides us with easier bug detection and fixing because it is human readable. The main constructs of pseudocode. The core of pseudocode is the ability to represent six programming constructs, always written in uppercase. They are the following. Sequence, case, while, repeat until, for, and if then else. These are also called keywords, used to describe the control flow of the algorithm. Sequence represents the linear task sequentially performed one after the other. Why is a loop with a condition at its beginning. Repeat until is a loop with a condition at the end or the bottom. For is another way of looping which is fixed. It has a fixed count or fixed number. If then else is a condition statement changing the flow of the algorithm. Case is the generalization form of if then else. Basically, if then else and case are almost the same whereas case is used for longer options. Usually, if the option is more than two or three, you use case. If it's only true or false, then you use it then else. These are the difference with the code construct. Okay, for sequence, we have input, and then you can use the following. Take note, guys, pseudo code does not have a generic form of stating that that is the input, that is the output, that is compute. So if you search in the internet, there are, there are different uh, codes or keywords that they use to tell the user that this is input, this is output. But we will have a fixed uh, keyword or a fixed syntax, which I will uh, show you later on so that uh, we will not have any trouble with our examples. So for the sequences are the following. Samples for for loop, sample for while, case. In for case, there is what we call default or others, which is the default option. We have the repeat until, and then the if then else. Take note if then else, true, the condition is true, then false, then repeat, the condition is at the bottom, for while, condition is at the beginning. Okay, for case. Notice it is just an if and else, but there are more fixes. For four, it is fixed or has a fixed size. Although the six contracts are the often most used ones, you can theoretically use them to implement any algorithm. You might find yourself needing some more based on your specific applications. Um, perhaps the two most needed commands, aside from those six, are what we call for invoking classes or functions, which is the call keyword, and then handling errors, 
or exception using the keyword exception. This example for that one. Of course, you might uh, add more constructs or keywords depending on the field that you are working. The rules of writing through the code always capitalize the initial word, often one of the main six contracts. Constructs or keywords have only one statement per line. In them, to show hierarchy, always, guys, when you are programming, never forget to indent to show that that code is under that particular code. Okay, let's say, for example, this particular piece of code has a 4 inside a 4 inside an else. And then inside the else, we have void. Now, this is what we call hierarchy. Okay? It means that this particular line will be executed first and then followed by this one. However, take note that once this particular condition has been exhausted, then that is the only time where X will be repeated again. Okay, take note of that. That is called hierarchy. That's why it's very important for you to indent your line to denote that that particular code is under this particular code, meaning to say you have to finish the innermost part first before going out. Okay, that is most important uh, that must be importantly followed, especially for coding Python, because Python is indent sensitive, meaning to say we have to indent lines in order for it to denote that that's, that is under one particular group or command. Take note of that, indention. Number four, always end multi-line sections using any of the end keyword if there is an end keyword. But for Python, which we will discuss by next week, there is no particular end keyword. But for other languages like C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, PHP, there is what we call an end keyword or terminator. Keep your statement programming language independent. Take note of that. The pseudocode must be independent of the programming language you are going to use, meaning it can be applied to any programming language. Number six, keep the naming domain of a problem, not that of the implementation. For example, append the last name to the first name instead of name is equals to first plus last. Okay? It's like saying that you need to tell or you need to state your code in an English language. Then number seven, keep it simple, concise, and readable. Okay. Here is an example of a good and a bad pseudocode. As you can see, um, for the good pseudocode writing, each and every line is almost aligned to the English language. Here, we use the keyword set, which means we are setting the value of the variable 1 to 1. But in this instance, notice that we use 4, which if you notice, is almost like a code for a program in this side. But in this side, it states what must be done for each and every variable. So the game board is occupied then, whereas here it is only equal to zero. Okay. That is the simple example of how you can write a good and a bad pseudo code. Always remember that a good pseudo code is almost pattern to the English language. When I teach my students to do code at first, they don't see the use of it. They think it's a waste of time as they put it, I write code twice. That might be the correct in the case of a simple, straightforward problem. However, as the complexity and the size of the problem increase, they start to realize how generating pseudo code makes writing the actual code much easier help you realize possible problems or design flaws in the algorithm earlier in the development stage, saving more time and effort and fixing bugs and avoiding errors. Moreover, the code allows programmers to communicate more efficiently with others from different backgrounds. Clear, concise, straightforward to the code can make a big difference in the road from idea to implementation, providing a smoother ride for the programmer.
is one of the overall tools under is created by the programming community, but the client needs to be utilized more. So this are samples of writing a pseudo code. And there are different ways now you can write pseudo code, but we'll follow a standard so that everyone will have a fixed pattern as I have said earlier. First, start with begin and end clause. If you're familiar with making a flowchart, our pattern will be similar to this. Note that our keyword should be in capital letters. If you're declaring variables, first state their data. For numbers, use number. For string, use string. For example, begin and number and age, comma, which denotes that there is another variable, then UBL money or double money. String, str name or string name. Number three, in order to accept input or variables, we use the keyword input to display our output. To display our output on the screen, you can use the output keyword. Okay, take note. In this example, we use set because the program is the one setting the value. But in this example, if you want to get input from the user, not from the computer, you use the keyword input. Take note of that. So thing your name, output, which means it will display this one to the screen, then request input from the user, which will be placed in nlam1, and which will uh, be displayed as in the screen as nlam1. Okay, actually, in this example, we forgot to place the variable declaration from, for nlam1. So we try to fix that one. Okay, I corrected the, the variable that should be uh, inputted and display should be str name. Okay, so we display enter your name on the screen. Then the user will enter the name into the variable str name and then it will display the inputted variable. Mathematical operations or comparisons can be used to compare values or perform arithmetic operations. Let's say, for example, begin and end, number and num1. And then in num two, okay, another typo error. Okay, number and num one and num two, okay, separated by comma to denote that uh, we have another variable after the first variable. To display the screen, enter number one, and then user will input our number into n num one. We display on the screen, enter number two user will input it into nlam2. And then if nlam1 is greater than nlam2, begin output creators1, nlam1, and else, take note, our if and else can have beginning and ending statement also. Or if uh, you want, you can just remove the beginning and ending statement here because we are only writing one statement. Actually, this example number four, which uh, output output or displays the greatest greater number between n num one and n num two, you can further simplify this one. Okay, like in my example here, the better or the good example here for if is that if the if statement is actually defined or stated more sim simpler or simpler. For example, if n num one is greater than n num two, output greatest one. Okay, else output greatest one and num two. Okay, you can do that also. Okay, but if you want to have a shorter code, you can do this one. But it's better to write actually in full English form. Other examples we have here number S1, S2, and sum output input number one, which will put which we will put into S1 variable S1, input number two, which we will put into variable S2. Sum is equals to S1 plus S2. You can also write this one as sum is equal to the sum of S1 plus S2. You could do that also. But this one is for shorter things. Again, if you want to write a, a better pseudocode example, you could write this one in full English language. Okay. 
Then the output, which will be displayed on the screen, is sound. Put to install and code, code Python on Android with Fibroid 3. Portable coding in Python is possible thanks to the Fibroid, Fibroid 3 Integrated Development Environment or IDE. Fibroid is a minimalist Python 3 interpreter that lets you execute minor projects and do minimal coding on your Android device. You also want to learn Python programming anywhere without a PC while replicating the PC platform for Python on Android. Fibroid is the right app to try out. Whether you're new to Python programming or you're an expert, let's see some of the ways you can use Fibroid 3 to its full potential on your Android device. How do you get Fibroid 3 and its plug-in setup? Now, Fibroid 3 guys is available on the Play Store. Now, in this example, I will be using the stocks, but the same applies when using your Android device. So first, you need to be, of course, connected to the internet in order for you to download Fibroid. However, once Fibroid is installed, it does not require you to have an active internet connection. So that's the good thing in using Fibroid. So first is we download, download Fibroid in our Play Store. Okay, Fibroid 3, IDE for Python, so let's install. Also, we need to download two other plugins in order for Fibroid to work properly, uh, namely the Fibroid repository plugin and the Fibroid permission plugin, which allows us Fibroid to create folders and files inside your device. Okay. So, repository plugin. I already installed this one. And the permissions plugin. I already installed the permissions plugin. Okay. So, download those three files in order for us to get started in working with. Android. Next, pip install packages. Once you have everything set up, you can start using pip to install packages for, for your projects. Now, packages, guys, are basically add-ons to our uh, Pinoid app in order for it to work with other components. Like, let's say, for example, we want to have support for GUI because um, you want to program using GUI. GUI, guys, is the interface that you see when accessing uh, forms or Windows programs like the buttons, the backgrounds, the images, hyperlinks, stuff like that. Um, normally, if you will not use GUI, your Python code will be executed and run in a DOS-like environment, meaning it's a black and white environment where you can enter uh, data and output data, but you, it doesn't have support for mouse or mouse click. Just a simple uh, keyboard and enter info. Okay. Hydroid 3 comes with an interface that allows you to install packages without writing your commands in the terminal. There are several ways to install key packages in Hydroid 3. To access that feature tap on the menu icon, okay, which looks like the lines at the top left corner of the app. Next, go to PIP. At the top, at the top of the PIP menu, select search libraries to get more options about the module you want to install, or you can tap the quick install option to install the packages listed by default. So let us there. So this is the, right now it's installing, so let us finish. Okay, so everything is installed. So from here, you can actually install the PIP packages that you want. You can do a quick install. If you want, or if you already know the packages that you want to install, you can search for the libraries that you want. 
this uh, right now these are the libraries that we have already installed so for now we do not need to install any additional libraries but if you want to dive deeper into python programming you can make use of this pip extension in order for you to expand the capabilities of python in your android phone So this is just an explanation on how you can install additional libraries. Using the inbuilt, inbuilt PyDroid 3 command line interface or CLI. Okay, as I have uh, told you before, our default environment for PyDroid will look like DOS, specifically Linux command line interface or CLI. Access it, tap on the menu icon at the top left corner of the app and select terminal. Okay. If you want to go to the Linux command line interface. Okay. Although running the pip install packages command via its inbuilt terminal takes some time to load, it still lets you navigate easily between folders and create new ones whenever right information is allowed and your device. However, while the slow loading of PIP installing packages by the terminal is a minor issue with the PyDroid IDE, its PIP menu solves it. Using the Python shell, the blank page that appears when you open PyDroid 3 is the inbuilt Python shell. Okay? So this is the inbuilt Python shell where we could type our code. Just like the Python shell on your PC, it sees any command written on it as a Python code by default. Use the shell, type any Python command, and click the big play button at the lower, at the editor's lower left corner. So after uh, writing the code, in order for you to run the code, just click this yellow button. This opens a Python interpreter that displays the output of your code. Okay, so when you click the button here, it will output your code in our CLI. And if you want to exit the CLI, you can just type exit. Save folders and files on your device. Just like any other code editor, Python. PyDroid 3 has an interface that lets you save your file in any main folder on your device. If you want to create a project folder, you also get to make new folders while it's file saving with this file saving option. To use the folder option, type the folder sign at the top right corner of the empty shell. Tap save and select internal storage. Next, tap on the preferred destination folder and tap select folder at the top of the screen. On the next menu, enter a preferred file name and click on save. Okay, so let's try to do that. Okay. We want to save data on our internal storage. Okay, new folder. So let's type here icon. This is a new folder. We select the folder and we enter our file. So the file will be called new file. Okay, so it's now save. However, if you like to create a new project folder, repeat the process but tap on the new folder option. Instead of select folder, give your new folder a preferred name, which we have created earlier. And tap create to save the folder. Click on select folder. Name your new file and tap save. Save your new file in the folder you just created. Note that the newly created file doesn't need a file extension if it's a Python file. But in case you, use, you need to use another language, 
file to, ser to serve your project, ensure that you include the file extension that applies to that language while saving the file. For instance, a CSS file should be saved as name.css, replacing name with your preferred file name. CSS file, guys, is a file used to design and style web pages, but we will not tackle that. Um, this is just an option if you want to save a new file aside from Python. So remember the file extension for Python is what? That py. Update the changes you've made an existing file, tap the folder sign on the top right corner of the editor and select save. Next, save. If you want your new file to be in the same directory as the existing one, ensure that you select, you select the same folder that contains the existing one. Customizing the IDE. You can also customize the development environment if you like. You can change the appearance of your editor, tap the three menu icon at the top left corner of the screen, go to settings, appearance, and switch to your preferred theme or select other available appearance options. Okay. For example, usually while I'm programming, I prefer it to have a black interface. I think it's easier for the eyes and it's easier for me to read. So it depends on you. So if you want to change the interface we have here, for example, um, you can change the editor if you want. Change the appearance. For example, the thing that I want is dark. And if I want to make the font size smaller, or if I want to change the default font. Okay, so now it's the dark theme. To get more customization features, tap the editor option and select your preferences. You can also tap the other options within the settings menu to see the options available to you. However, when you click on the team menu that one icon, the terminal settings option offers some terminal configuration as well. So it depends on you, but uh, for me, do not touch or change uh, some settings here that might affect the how your Pydroid program behaves. So it's best just to change the appearance if you want. Okay, now after doing that, um, in order for us to test if your PyDroid is working, the most common file to test or to check any programming languages if it's working is the Hello World sample. If you want to check out sample PyDroid programs or what Python can do, you can just click the menu option and then get samples and then go to basics. So in this example, let's say I want to test hello world. Click open. Then uh, if our PyDroid 3 is working properly, it will display hello world on our screen. So let's click run. It's working. When you click on enter, happens. You want to go back and just can click here or let's click here. Okay, so go back to the program. If you want to change it, Okay, so our PyDroid 3 is working. Next unit, we will be starting on the different workings or the different requirements needed for us to work with programming, specifically Python, as well as the equivalent pseudocode that uh, we will be using in order for us to perform or to set up the logic that uh, we will be using in our program. Okay, so that is all for this.
Really, thank you.